Okay, uh, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Uh, you've heard that, haven't you? Yeah, it was uh, said by, um, uh, maybe not the first time, but he took credit for it. Charles Diedrich, and he lived from 1913 to 1997. I think just about everybody in my generation has heard that phrase, and perhaps maybe you or someone else has even repeated it once or twice. Uh, I didn't meet the guy, Charles Diedrich, who coined it, uh, but I've, I've been to his house. Yeah, yeah, I've been to his house. Anyway, in 1958, the year I was born, uh, Diedrich founded Synanon House, an alcohol and drug rehabilitation program based on Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the program he'd gone through uh, and, uh, and found uh, recovery there. And so he started one similar to that for drug addicted because Alcoholics Anonymous didn't do much with the drug addicted. They slightly different, and it didn't work quite well for them. Um, anyway, this is it's starting to sound like it's going to have a happy ending to this story, doesn't it? But, but it doesn't. <laughs> no happy endings here. Uh, anyway, as a 17-year-old student at Riverside City College, I visited Synanon House with my sociology class. Yeah, see, I wasn't recovering either. Uh, I didn't even know universities did field trips. In fact, that's the only one I ever went on. Um, but in, in reality, it felt more like a recruiting drive, like we were kind of bust out there to get the pitch. Yeah. You know? Uh, we were all young, naive, looking for answers and Sunan seemed to have them all. Um, in fact, their treatment was so effective, or at least it considered to be effective. The courts began sending offenders to Sunan rather than sending them to jail. They would pay Sunan to try to rehabilitate them. But uh, actually, there's no real magic to it. Once signed in, all contact was severed uh, with the uh, uh, um, previous people. House members were isolated uh, from family and people who might have been doing drugs with them. And they began abrupt and total withdrawal. So just no drugs whatsoever. And, uh, of course, it was successful, so successful, few questioned that Diedrich uh, called, his, uh, called his experimental community. The house was set up in an older luxury hotel just a few steps from Santa Monica Beach. And at their, their height, they actually had more than one. They had different locations, but I've only looked in the Santa Monica one. Anyway, Synodon volunteers were kind, caring, talented. Uh, one of the requirements was they had the people that lived in the house had to learn a musical instrument. Um, in fact, they even released their own albums. Uh, they made a movie. There was a movie made, uh, released, and was popular made a million dollars or so, which was a lot at the time back in, uh, I guess it would be the mid-60s. Um, they started their own school. So these were families. They got had some married couples. People got married. They had children. They had school. They did their own school for them. At their peak, they had managed to squeeze about 1,300 people into the house in Santa Monica. Uh, and, uh, and also they had banked about $33 million dollars. So they had the, things were looking pretty good, but there were just a few red flags. Um, Synanon had started as a fairly typical halfway house for recovering alcoholics and drug addicts back in '58. Uh, they were supposed to um, keep people safe and secure for one or two years, and then rehabilitate them and re let them release back in the community. But it, actually, it grew into a commune. People checked in. But they didn't check out. I wonder if this is what Hotel California, I wonder if this is what the song's about. Senna, it'd be. Uh, anyway, families joined and, and residents married, had children, their needs increased, uh, but so did their reputation and their cash flow. Uh, donations and government funds poured in uh, in recognition of their unusual success. Anyway, uh, newcomers were assigned the most basic duties, uh, cooking, cleaning, things like that. Um, they, they started a school for the children. They staffed themselves. Uh, they even started an unaccredited law school and uh, really went to town on that because they had a few legal troubles. So this was helpful for them. Uh, when my um, sociology class showed up, we were given the red carpet treatment. Uh, we were greeted by a beautiful young professional woman uh, wearing like a Donna Reed dress, you know, that kind that flows out. Yeah. Almost old-fashioned now. It is old-fashioned. It was, it was then, too. A big smile. She had these huge hooped, ear, hooped earrings on, okay, and a shaved head. <laughs> that was the unusual part. 
Um, anyway, she took us on the tour and told us all about the Synanon success. And I was impressed. We all were. It looked like the biggest and best family on the planet. I mean, on the surface, everything was just wonderful. It looked like paradise. Uh, I'd never seen so many smiles. But it did seem strange that everyone, at least the ones I met, had decided to shave their heads. Every man, every woman, every child uh, looked like it was like the first day of Army Basic. It was short, probably, yeah, shorter than mine is now. Short, short, short. Um, but they insisted it was voluntary. Our guide said a few people started it, others followed, and many felt it was attractive. And certainly she was one of them. Uh, but still, it was unsettling. It was unusual. And someone asked the question, I think we were all thinking, is this religious? Because it looked, it looked <laughs> cult-like. <laughs> it looked religious. Uh, and the answer was no, many of us are religious, but uh, Synanon is not a religion, we were told. Actually, they had filed for um, a, 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 to be a religious organization at that time which they, maybe she didn't even know, but they did it mainly for tax purposes. It had nothing to do with um, wanting to be a true religion of some kind. But when they did it, they uh, and they were filing the paperwork, one of the guys that was doing the filing said, so, uh, Charles, uh, we're going to get all this done. Who, who's going to be God? <laughs> I, think, I think, as the story goes, it's going to develop how, how that works out. Anyway, so uh, it was odd, as I said. So, um how often does an entire community uh, ever agree on anything? And shaving their heads seem like an unusual thing. So I kept thinking, well, there's something they're not telling us. Uh, and uh, and then things started to go wrong uh, for them. So uh, Charles Edward D Diedrich, C-E-D, he was known uh, on a lot of paperwork. Uh, he founded what he believed would be the ideal community, a new and improved way of living based on caring cooperation. Sounds fabulous, doesn't it? Uh, most seem to think it began with something called the Synanon game. That's where things started to go wrong. It was the one time when the smiles would be set aside and the anger and the emotions would flow. In it, participants would share their personal thoughts and stories, and then the rest of the group would be free, encouraged, to criticize them strongly, completely, and thoroughly often reducing the individual to sobbing. And I guess it started out as just verbal and then actually got to be physical as well. Anyway, sometimes the game lasted as long as three days without sleep. Just this thing going on and on. Anyway, uh, the authorities began to notice there were some problems. The, the addicts were checking into the program, but no one was checking out. No one was getting out of this thing. So no recovering alcoholics. Uh, on one side, that was good, no one on the street, but uh, they, that's a bad sign when you're dealing with a, a program. You know, if they don't have any, if nobody wants to leave. <laughs> anyway, anyway, family members uh, of the people who were inside the hotel started asking questions. Uh, but the criticism was still very light when I visited in 1976. Uh, the really tough years were just ahead, just about to begin. Anyway, uh, Chuck Diedrich's uh, third wife died of cancer in 1977. Most felt that she had been the calming influence on the group and certainly on its founder. So any eccentricity, she seemed to modify a bit. But with her death, things began to change. After a time of mourning, CED, uh, Chuck began taking applications for a new wife. Well, I don't know. Sounds strange, maybe eccentric. Uh, but many, many were interested. He got many applications. And then he began to question the entire idea of marriage. Why should anyone tie themselves down for a lifetime? He, I think, lost one wife to death and, and two to divorce, I think. So uh, he declared marriages would be reduced to a three-year contract, and Synanon, the organization, would pick the next match. Some didn't agree, and they just left. They said, no, that's not what we're here for. But many, many stayed um, and, and and agreed to his ideas. I think uh, numbers I seem to think is what maybe it affected about 200 couples, so about 400 people, or I guess more, um, who um, allowed their marriages to be, I guess, nullified and, 
and new contracts written. Uh, Diedrich also seemed to be to grow tired of caring for the children. Uh, he closed the school and encouraged women to terminate pregnancies and the men to get vasectomies. Once again, it was voluntary, but many did. So uh, the influence was strong. And then the game started getting violent. After um, leaving Synodon late that night, uh, our college class, uh, we banned to make our way back from Santa Monica to Riverside, where we all lived. That's where our university was, uh, Riverside City College. Uh, we stopped at a Denny's, and everyone was buzzing. We'd seen something exciting, something unique. It looked like it had the potential to change the world. It looked, you know, amazing. Uh, at that time, we couldn't see the cobwebs. No one told us about the beatings or the threats. Uh, no one mentioned Rose Lena Cole to us. I'll tell you about her later. It was a sociology class. Some were uh, planning on a major in this field. Some wanted to leave RCC immediately and join the group now. Was I one of them? No. Somehow I knew this wasn't it. Even though I, well, I liked what I saw. You know, just like everybody else, I was impressed. But I, somehow I knew this wasn't for me. I didn't know the secrets. I was still pretty naive. I did, couldn't see beyond the, the, uh, the sort of facade. But I, I knew every family has secrets. They don't tell you their bad news right there. Yeah. Anyway, the beautiful young student sitting next to me at Denny's was convinced. She wanted to be part of Synodon. Uh, so she was tugging at her long blonde hair thinking, what, what about this? Because <laughs> that would go. Um, anyway, uh, let's call her Grace. I don't actually remember her name, but Gra Grace is a good name for her. Anyway, Grace was only 18. She was still living at home, and after our short visit, she was ready to make the big trade. She only wondered if she should stay long enough to pick up her diploma or if they would want her to finish her diploma first. I was just dying when I heard her talking. I couldn't see how she could walk away without a degree and walk away from her family after a two-hour two presentation by a room full of strangers. She didn't know anybody there, neither did I. How, how could she do that? Anyway, so I spent the next 45 minutes trying to convince her it would be a mistake. Everybody has to grow up sometime. You can't just, you know, quit one family, join a bigger one with a better dad. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Anyway, anyway, the next time I heard about Synodon was in October of 1978. So just about two years down the road. Anyway, uh, two members had slipped a rattlesnake, a live rattlesnake, into a lawyer's mailbox, and the bite had almost killed him. Um, this unusual event would kind of wake up call for the Santa Monica police. They descended in force, and they looked through the records, they looked through the files, and they found over 80 incidents of uh, violence between 1974 and 1978, including more than one case of attempted murder. Uh, Synanon kept records uh, religiously, so that was one thing like a religion. Uh, they filed uh, every internal memo, uh, and they had audio copies of every lecture, and now the police had it all. In one recording, the man who coined the phrase, today is the first day of the rest of your life, also said this, we're not going to mess with the old time, turn the other cheek religious postures. Our religious posture is, don't mess with us. You can get killed dead, literally dead, um, and more. That I, I didn't put in the worst of it, really. Uh, anyway, Grace, uh, I, I don't know her future plans, but she did stay in class. She finished the semester, uh, and after that, we lost touch. I didn't really know her except for that one class. And so I don't know if she returned to Santa Monica or not. Um, anyway, um, despite their, their coming close a couple times, uh, they didn't actually kill anyone, and uh, and no one at Synanon did any real hard time. Diedrich's followers took the best deals they could get for assault and uh, conspiracy to commit murder. Uh, they were lucky because they failed to kill anyone, uh, although they came close. Uh, his lawyers pleaded that the man issuing orders, Charles Edward Diedrich, was just too old, too ill to go to jail, which, you know, I, I don't know why that would make a difference, but anyway, he got probation, he had probation, uh, his, but his first days of the rest of his life were no longer as bright as they used to be. 
when they arrested the former alcoholic in December of 78, he was drunk. At least that's he appeared to be. Uh, he was right back where he had started 25 years before uh, when he joined AA. As uh, one of the conditions of his probation, he could no longer manage Synanon. And most thought he'd be unable to stay away and it would eventually violate the probation and end up in jail. But as it turns out, um, the ill and aging ringleader had 20 years left. He wasn't as old <laughs> as we thought. Yeah, and so um, and he didn't want to spend those 20 years in jail. So, uh, so he did. He stayed away. He didn't manage it. Um, anyway, the uh, Internal Revenue Service retroactively revoked Sunan's tax-exempt status. So they went back. And they ordered them to pay $17 million in back taxes. And this, the bad press they'd gotten through the uh, murder attempts, the loss of their leader, the leadership, uh, it led to their decline and eventual fall. And they eventually closed the doors for the last time completely about a decade later. Uh, everything takes a little time. Unfortunately, some of their behavioral modification programs live on. They still exist today under the name of CEDU Educational Services, and later under a variety of names. Does that make sense? CEDU? Charles Edward Dietrich. Yeah, the, uh, the Synanon game is still sometimes used, celebrated. And, um, and Rose Lynn Nicole is still missing. In 1972, Rose, it was a 15-year-old runaway. And she was ordered by the court to undergo drug treatment at Synanon. But somewhere along the way, she disappeared. Anyway, the family received a few letters, reportedly from her, um, saying she was well and that she would make contact with them again. But they never actually saw her again. If alive... She would be 63 today, just about the same age as Grace should be, 63. Hopefully, they are both well.